All right. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I have Brother Mike here with me this evening, and we'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope, Monday night Bible Q&A. And uh, as you can see, I do not have Brother Justin with us this evening. Uh, he's probably uh, he's still taking care of a lot of uh, personal things, uh, especially concerning his job. But uh, we're going to do our best to give an uh, answer to tonight's question. And I always like to give the reminder about the email address for those of you that have questions uh, in the Bible, preferably in the Bible. Uh, if you look on the bottom of your screen scrolling, uh, it'll say trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. That's trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. If you send your questions there, I will share them with Brother Mike and Brother Justin. If you know, Brother Justin can get on, uh, we'll sh I'll share the question and we'll do our best to give you a Bible answer out of the good old King James Bible. Amen. And we'll do our best to do that. Uh, we're not Mr. Know-it-alls, but we'll do our best to give a, a study on your answer to be a help, uh, to minister also to those that uh, don't really know too much about the Bible. Maybe we can help out and get more people involved in the Word of God, studying the Word of God, believing the Word of God, and ultimately for those that are lost and undone to get saved by the Word of God. And uh, that would certainly be a blessing to us as well as them. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and go to uh, the ultimate question that every person needs to ask themselves. And that's if you die today, where would your soul spend eternity? Um, that is a the ultimate universal question that we need to ask ourselves. I mean, we can answer all your questions, but if you did not answer that question yourself and know where you're going when you die, uh, you're still probably yet in your sins and you need to get this thing right. So I'm going to share a, a simple, short gospel message with you. And Brother Mike may, may as well uh, do that, too. And that's uh, over 2000 years ago. God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. He lived the holy, perfect, sinless life. He did no sin. He knew no sin. And in him is no sin. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He had no sin as in his nature. He never thought sinful thoughts because there was no sin inside of him. And he lived that perfect, sinless life. The Bible says he kept all the law. He even kept the law that you and I could not keep. Uh, he's completely righteous, completely holy. And then for the purpose of doing the Father's will by uh, making himself a sacrifice for all humanity. It's what we call the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He got on that old rugged cross and died for the sins of the whole world. And then the most miraculous thing happened. It wasn't just the fact that he took all the sins upon himself, which is completely miraculous, but he rose again from the dead, able to justify all from sin, who would believe and trust what he did on the cross for their sins. So if you'd simply believe and trust in him, he'd save you from your sins. Okay. And for those of you that are saved, why don't we just look back at what Jesus Christ had already did and try our best every day to live the victorious Christian life in light of the love of what Christ has already did for us on the cross and his resurrection. I'm going to go ahead and pass over to Mike to open up. Go ahead, brother. Wait a minute. Good, good to see everybody here. Thank you so much for um, your interest in God's word. Again, like Brother Ed said, the most important question we can ask you, we're here to answer questions, but we have a question for you. Where will you spend eternity? And where you spend eternity is based on what you do with the truth of God's word. Jesus Christ is God, God manifested in the flesh, and Jesus Christ wants you to believe the gospel. The gospel is presented in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to read the first couple of verses to you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and herein ye stand, by which, ye also, by which also ye are saved. You're saved because of the gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ did something no one else did. 
He defeated death. He defeated hell. He defeated sin in the grave. He walked out of that grave under his own power. No person has ever walked out of the grave by their own power. Lazarus walked out of the grave, but it was by Jesus' power. No other person, Muhammad, Buddha, Joseph Smith, the popes, they're still in the grave, and they're not coming out by their own power. Jesus Christ had victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. He wants to give that victory to you, but you have to repent of your sins and believe solely in his finished work on the cross. Hey, man, appreciate that, Brother Mike, and uh, always a blessing. And let's go ahead. Uh, without further ado, we're going to go to the first question, and I'm going to go ahead and put that on the screen. Let's see if I can get it up there. There. Okay, there we go. It's right there. Now, uh, let me go and go to my notes, and I'm going to read you what I got as the first question here. And I don't mention any names, uh, as you guys know, uh, just so people don't think we're preaching at people that are asking the questions. Uh, a lot of times we, we refute false doctrine, and we're not trying to say the people that ask the question believe all the false doctrine. But sometimes we'll have something in the question that deals with false doctrine, and we'll rebuke that false doctrine. A lot of times people end up getting the wrong idea that we're trying to rebuke the people asking the question. So that's why we don't, we don't do that anymore because I did have a lot of people in the past, you know, tell me, you know, uh, brother Ed, you hurt my feelings because you were, you're, you're yelling at me on the broadcast, <laughs> you know, and I, and I really was, I, I really, and Mike knows, Mike knows, cause you know, we, we do Q and A's in, in, in the mission and everything. And we, I just speak to, Generally, I just speak and I refute false doctrine and I don't want people to get the wrong impression. So if you see me get motivated, if you see me get passionate, if you see me uh, really get hyped up about refuting some false doctrine, don't think I'm attacking anybody. OK, mm -hmm. I'm attacking the false doctrine. That's what I'm attacking. OK, so hopefully you guys understand that. And that's why I don't do the names anymore. OK, so so there's so, so let's go ahead. Um, I'm going to ask the question here. And here it is. Hi, brothers. Thanks for taking my question. Jacob's Ladder, John 151. Angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What is the purpose for the angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth? And I'm going to let Brother Mike have dibs on this the, uh, on this question. So, hey amen. I'm going to throw the football to Brother Mike. Amen. 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 <laughs> past completed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's start off in the passage, First John, uh, John chapter one. We're going to go back a few verses. Let's start back in verse forty-four. Now, Philip was at Bethsaida. Was at Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathaniel and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can any can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And here's our verse. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, the key to this, I believe we have to go all the way back to Genesis and look at Jacob's vision. I think that's the key to this, to understanding this passage. We have to go back to Genesis chapter 28 and verse 12, and where, J where Jacob has his vision. Jacob is alone in the desert. He makes a pillow out of rocks, he falls asleep and has a vision. Genesis 28, chapter 12, and he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. 
and behold the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Now we're not too far removed from Genesis chapter 11 when all the people on the earth got together and tried to build a tower to make themselves get to heaven. Now, when, when you're looking at this Jacob's Ladder, you have to really think about this tower that men trying to find their own way to heaven. Men today are trying to find their own way around Jesus Christ, around God's word, around God's righteousness to get to heaven on their own merits. If there are so many false religions that make you believe, give you false confidence in their way to get to heaven, and that's just another tower of Babel. You're trying to find heaven on your own. The only way to heaven is Jesus Christ. Now, Jacob was shown that even though he thought he was alone, his situation is being cared for in heaven. He was made to see that heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon an imaginary ladder, a mystical ladder, reaching from earth to heaven. Jesus says, verily, verily, listen, listen, and try to get your attention. You see that the communication between heaven and earth is wide open. And the Son of Man is the real ladder in this exchange. Jesus Christ is God. God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is our mediator, our mediator between God and man. God reveals himself to Jacob and reaffirms the covenant he made with Abraham, promising Jacob, who will later be called Israel, that his offspring will be many and that the promised land will one day belong to his descendants. Now, in this vision, Jacob sees something similar to a ladder, which signifies a connection between God and man. In this instance, it was God who provided the means necessary to link himself to man, as opposed, again, to the men in Genesis chapter 11. God is making the way in Genesis 28. God is making the way for man and him to have fellowship. On the contrary, Genesis chapter 11, man was trying to make his way to get to God, with, and without the law, without righteousness, without good deeds, they were just going to get to heaven on their own merit. They tried to reach heaven by their own actions, aside from any help of God. Now, these two passages of Scripture reflect differing school of thought over the issue of salvation. One group tries to reach heaven based on their own actions, without God's help, but the other group has access to heaven based on the provisions of God, and only the provisions of God. Salvation has not changed. You have to have the provision of God. You have to do it God's way. You have to do it with righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're not getting to heaven by yourself. You're not good enough. You're not righteous enough. You cannot be good enough. I cannot pay for one sin, let alone a lifetime of sins. I'm a sinner. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, I can't pay for my sins. I cannot be good enough. I cannot be righteous enough to pay for one of my sins. Jesus Christ on the cross paid for all of my sins. He is my way to heaven. He is my way out of sin. Now, we see Jacob's dream as representing Jesus Christ who came to earth and became that ladder or that stairway for us to connect with God and the relationship with Jesus Christ is because he is the one who severed my sin debt. The, the, the gulf that was between me and God was severed by Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access to God because of Jesus Christ. We don't have access to God because of my good deeds. We have access to God because of Jesus Christ's good deeds. According to the Bible, Jesus was our Jacob's ladder, who came to earth from the line of Jacob, through the provisions of God, and redeemed us so that we may live in heaven for all eternity. We mentioned the gospel when we started this off. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have nothing to do with the gospel. I only part of the gospel I have is believing in it. The only part of the gospel I have is trusting in it. In this passage, Jesus Christ shows his deity and that the word was made flesh. If you notice in the, in the chapter, in chapter 28, um, 
It says the angels of God are ascending and descending upon it. Jesus says they're going to be ascending upon the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man must be God. Jesus Christ is, is showing him his deity. Now, um, in this passage, Jesus shows his deity. Genesis 28, 12, again, and he dreamed, and a ladder was set up on the earth. The top reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. The ladder is Jesus. Jesus is God. The angels of God are the angels in which the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is being used as the ladder. This is his human nature. This is the second Adam. This is the seed of the woman. This is prophecy being fulfilled out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only mediator who bridges the gap, who bridges the gap from heaven to earth. He is the one through which the fullness of all celestial blessings flows down to us. And through him, we, in turn, can ascend to God. I have boldness. I can enter the throne room of God through Jesus Christ. I have boldness to make my petitions to heaven through Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus Christ says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You're not going to build a Tower of Babel. You're not going to sneak up your own way. You're not going to find your own, own concoction to get to to heaven. Jesus Christ is the way. In the English language, the word the is a definite article. He is definitely the only way. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is that mediator. He is that ladder. He is the bridge between me and and heaven. He is the bridge between me and God. Hebrews 9 15, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death or the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. It is because of the great mediator that we are able to stand before God clothed in his righteousness not my righteousness, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ himself. On the cross, Jesus Christ exchanged my sin for his righteousness. Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary, was beaten. He was stabbed. He had a crown of thorns pressed into his head. He had his hands and his feet nailed. He did this for the joy that was set before him. And what was that joy that was set before him? That was me. That was you. Jesus Christ did that. Jesus Christ gave me his righteousness. Jesus Christ gave me his glory. Jesus Christ gave me a home in heaven. Jesus Christ gave me eternal life. And what did Jesus Christ get out of the deal? He got me. I get all the good stuff, and Jesus gets me. Jesus gained nothing in the picture. He went back to heaven, the exact same place he was before, the exact same worship he had before. The only thing different is now access to heaven is granted. The veil was torn in two. I have access to God the Father through Jesus Christ. First Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians 5.21, for he hath made him to be sin for us Amen. who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ took my sin upon him. He knew no sin. And I get to put the righteousness of Jesus Christ on myself because I have accepted the only way to heaven the latter is Jesus Christ. He is the only means of salvation. So if you if you could combine these two passages, Genesis 28 and John 1, you can see that the, the vision that Jacob saw was just a, a vision of what's going to happen in the future. Jesus Christ is coming, and he is that ladder. He is the only way to heaven. My friend, if you're trusting in anything else, to get yourself to heaven. If you're trusting in your family heritage, if you're trusting in your pastor, if you're trusting in money or your good deeds or water baptism, if you're trusting in anything outside of Jesus Christ, my friend, you're lost on your way to hell. You've got to be trusting fully in Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. There's no truth outside of him, and he is the light. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Brother Ed? Hey, Amen. Appreciate that, Brother Mike. Uh, great answer. Uh, 
you could have a lot of speculation on this particular answer. Uh, we can say a lot of different things and maybe even have some principles in the Bible that we can go to and and kind of draw some, you know, some kind of conjecture out of that. But I always try to say to people, don't be so dogmatic about certain things, because if you don't have a clear passage of Scripture that specifically states something, you're, you're just you're just giving opinion, just like somebody else can give their opinion. And, and this a lot of times people divide over these kind of things. And it's not good to divide over those kind of things, guys. I mean, uh, if you have a different opinion about that, that's fine. I mean, OK, if. if I would just tell you, let's, let's just be fully persuaded in our minds about the scriptures on the clear things that we can be clear about. And let's uh, fellowship on the blood of Christ and the cross work of Christ on the things we're not too sure about. <laughs> um, people want to divide over everything. You got to with some people, you got to agree with everything or they don't want to fellowship with you. It, it's crazy, guys. Um, Bible never teaches any of that. OK, so we must be careful with how we handle the scriptures and be careful with how you handle what you're going to base your fellowship on, too. OK, so I think that's very important. So before I dive into this, uh, be very careful, okay? Um, I'm going to give you some verses, and I'm going to tell you my take on it. And I don't have a, a, huge, uh, a huge dogmatic stand on this, but there are a few things that I do have a dogmatic stand on, and I'll, you know, I'll let you know those things, okay? So let's go ahead and dive into this thing, uh, John 1, 51. I, I just kind of want to also refresh on the question here, which it says, um, Jacob's ladder, angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. What is the purpose for the angels uh, ascending and descending from heaven to earth? Yeah, uh, I see everybody uh, concerned about Mike. He didn't pop back in yet. I guess he got off maybe for some technical difficulties. So I don't know if he's getting back on or not. He did say his side. So I don't know. He might get if he pops back in, I'll put him on the screen. But he hasn't popped back on yet. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and try to do my side. And I'll, like I said, if, if Brother Mike pops back in, I'll get him in on the screen. OK, so. Uh, that is the question there. What is the purpose for the angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth? And it's not really like what is the uh, what about these angels descending upon the son of man? What's the son of man about? So, you know, we want to we want to, uh, you know, a lot of times we end up sidetracking, you know, the context in the passage. We kind of want to know about these angels and we kind of get our focus off of Jesus and we're on to some angels. And if you're if you've been to, to church any amount of time, a Bible believing church, you know that it's not good to get your eyes off of Jesus um, when you're dealing in the passages of Scripture. Always keep your eyes on Jesus. OK, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to read John 151 and let's go ahead and read it. And he saith unto him, so that's Jesus saying unto Nathanael, right? Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. All right, so we just pop right in there. We read that. We're like, well, what, you know, what is that all about? Well, I'm going to give you a few things here, truly. We should read the whole context here because we're, I'm going to end up getting into the context as we we get further into the study. I'm, I'm really going to get deeper into the context and I'm going to show you some things that actually matter about the context concerning John 151 and uh, Nathaniel's idea of uh, Jesus dealing with him about this truth of Genesis. So. A few, a few points I want to make about John 151 if you're there. Now, pay attention. Look at the verse as I'm going through this. Heaven is open hereafter, meaning before this point, right? Heaven was not open in this manner. Come on, here, doesn't it say hereafter? And he saith unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter. So anything before this. The time Jesus spoke right there, heaven was not opened in this way, right? 
Come on, let's zoom in on what it actually says. The purpose for heaven being open hereafter is so the angels of God can ascend and descend upon who? The Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Well, the Son of Man is the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning the Son of Man is the object of the hereafter and heaven being opened. Okay, do, do, come on, do, do we understand that? Everybody, everybody on the same page. So, hereafter, from that point, while Jesus Christ in his first advent is talking to Nathaniel right there. Come on, right there. He says, hereafter, this, this whole ordeal is going to happen. Now, um, I want you to kind of key in on some things with me in different passages here. Go to Acts 7, 56. Go to Acts chapter 7, verse 56. So turn there in your Bible. And the Bible says, And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Who's, who's talking there? Stephen, right? In Acts 7, he's about to be stoned to death. And what, is he, what does he say? He's, he says, behold, I see heavens opened. And the who? The Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. You see that? Didn't we just say in John 151, heaven would be open from that point after? Right. Acts 7, 56, we have a truth about heaven open and uh, uh, Stephen is ready to be received. Why? Because Jesus Christ had already died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day. And that was the truth of John 151 being Jacob's ladder, right? Jacob's ladder, that there would be a way in prophecy according to Genesis, right? That was revealed by Jesus Christ in John 151 to Nathaniel saying, look, hereafter, you're going to see this thing happen. And here, we fast forward to Acts 7, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, heaven is open and what's happening? Stephen is now able to enter heaven on Jacob's ladder, the son of man. Amen. How about that? Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 11. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 11. Let's read this one. And saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. The only reason why I'm reading like kind of like partial scripture, I'm kind of in the middle of the context, because I'm trying to show you the references that are referencing John 151. You know, heaven is open, right? That's what I'm trying to show you there. Heaven is open and a certain vessel descending. See, we're, we, we talk about ascending and descending of these angels, right? So what's happening right there in Acts 10? Well, Peter receives this vision, right, about going to the Gentiles, going to the Gentiles. And again, you know, I, I like to include this as my favorite. It's not just going to the Gentiles. It's also a release of the Old Testament law of having to keep some kind of dietary Old Testament law. He says, now you can eat, you can eat it all there, Peter. Peter, you can eat it all. Eat that bacon now. You know, there's a pigs in a blanket coming down now. It's descending. And, and who's causing this pigs in a blanket to descend? It's these angels. They're showing the vision to Peter. And he's like, mmm, tasty. Bacon is ready for me. And I'm trying to argue with God that I won't eat anything unclean. And then God says, well, it ain't unclean if you give thanksgiving to me. And hey, no Gentiles unclean because he's giving thanksgiving to me. And you go deliver him the gospel because this Gentile's giving thanksgiving to me because his alms were coming up before me and his prayers was coming up before me as a memorial. Guess what? You need to go over there and tell him about Jesus, you need to go there and tell him the gospel. And you know what Peter did? He went over there and did that. You know what? You know what he was telling him about? Jacob's ladder. He could have told. He could have told Cornelius, "Hey, you know what? I had a vision about Jacob's ladder." <laughs> That's literally what happened right there, right? Heavens were opened. Okay, now now look at Acts fourteen twenty seven. Look at Acts fourteen twenty seven. Look at this one. This is interesting. 
Acts 14, 20. Remember, Jacob's ladder. He was talking about hereafter. This Jacob's ladder is going to happen. This whole Jesus Christ is the son of man. The ability to be able to reach God from earth happened solely through the son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at Acts 14, 27. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had Open the door of faith unto the Gentiles. See, there's something opened here. Now, if he's opening up the door of faith unto the Gentiles, what is that telling you about heaven being opened <laughs> and being able to ascend there, <laughs> right? By the gospel, by the Son of Man, amen. Praise the Lord. Acts 14, 27, good, good reference for that. Now look at Revelation 4, 1. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. I want you to see this. So we did. We dealt a little bit about a man, a disciple, getting stoned to death and looking up and saying, wait a minute, how is heaven open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God? And he's able to go there because he's believed on the gospel. He's believed on the son of man and able to ascend now, not by his power, but by the power of the gospel, right? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Why? Because you're in Christ, right? Acts 10, 11, we saw that, you know, there was a uh, heaven was open and then the vessel descending. Why? The heaven, the, uh, the, the vessel was descending to show that, hey, these Gentiles can receive the gospel, right? So we're seeing all these aspects of heaven opened to Jews and Gentiles, right? And uh, Acts 14, 27, we saw that. Now, look at this is an interesting one in Revelation 4, 1. Look at Revelation 4.1. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. <laughs> How about that for Jacob's ladder? And the first voice which I heard was as, as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. You know, you know what? Jesus Christ made possible not only heaven being open for those that are lost and undone to get saved and now they can go to heaven based upon the son of man and the gospel but you know what there's something even more important here as well those that are alive that are in Christ and remain can now be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and heaven is open because the son of man is there and we're going to meet him in the air. Amen. Glory to God. That's some great stuff, ain't it? Jacob's ladder. Jesus is waiting now on the top of the ladder for us. Amen. Man can now get to God, amen. Praise the Lord. It's only through Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. All right, so then look at Revelation 19, 11. You say, Jacob's ladder. I don't want Jacob's ladder. I don't want that. I don't want the Son of Man. I don't want nothing that anything has to do with God or Jesus or this ladder. It's ridiculous. Who cares about that? I don't care. It's all vanity. It's all vanity. It's life under the sun. Go to Revelation 19, 11. I want to show you a truth about Jacob's ladder here. Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven opened. <laughs> I saw that was stars. I saw heaven open. We're talking future time. We're talking end of the tribulation. People failed to reach Jacob's ladder and climb up. Why? Because they did not believe the gospel. You can't climb up Jacob's ladder yourself and find another way. It's got to be through the son of man. But look, and I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. He is. He's faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. You know what? You don't want Jacob's ladder? Because heaven is open because of Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder is coming down to you. And there's going to be a judgment coming. See, you all thought it was great because you saw a ladder there. You thought it was all grace and mercy because there was a ladder that was made by Jesus. And you said, what's the big deal about the ladder? It's all vanity. You didn't climb up the ladder. You didn't think it was important. And now the ladder's coming to you. What a shame. 
What a shame. I don't want that to happen to anybody. I don't sit here and glory in the fact that Jesus Christ is going to come down that ladder and he's going to judge and make war. That's not a that's not going to be a fun thing for people, but it's true. In the passage of Revelation 19:11, in the in the same context as he doth judge and make war, there's the wording faithful and true. God's not a liar. It's faithful and true that the ladder's coming to you. Repent. Repent towards God and put faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the ladder that you need. He's the only means of getting from earth to heaven. You know that, right? Isaiah 59. He bridges the gap. You need a ladder. You have no way, you have no means to get from earth to heaven without Jesus. There's no way to get there. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 tell us, The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquity has separated between you and your God, and your sin has hid his face from you that he will not hear. It's what sin does. It's that great goal fixed. You cannot get, you cannot cross. Unless you have Jacob's ladder, cannot cross. You can't cross from earth to heaven. Sin gets in the way. So you need the mediator. That's what Brother Mike said earlier. The mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So Jesus Christ is the mediator. He's the one that bridges the gap between you and God. He bridges the gap between sin and forgiveness of sins. He bridges the gap between being an enemy of God and being in fellowship with God. See, he bridges the gap. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus alone that can bridge the gap. All right. Well, I have a little bit more here. Let's talk about John 1.50. Jesus answered and said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw un thee under the fig tree. So he's telling Nathaniel this. Uh, Believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. Huh? How about that? Greater things than these. Man, he's all overwhelmed because Jesus saw him under the fig tree. And, and, and he's like, whoa, you saw me there? You knew what I said? And Jesus says, well, you're going to see greater things than that. And then what does he give? He gives John 151 about heaven being open and the angels ascending and descending upon the son of man. So, let, so let's look at this. The fig tree. Now, remember, he was all about this fig tree. He's all overwhelmed and awed at the fig tree uh, account right there, right? The fig tree represents the nation of Israel and the, and the physical kingdom of heaven. And also represents prosperity and peace with a typology of the millennial reign of Christ in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Luke 13, 6 to 7, there is no fruit on the fig tree right now. In, oh, let me scroll down a little bit. In Mark 8, 11, 18 to 21, Jesus had cursed the fig tree because it had no fruit and it withered away and was dried up from the roots. This is the nation of Israel's spiritual condition. In Matthew 13, 28, when the fig tree is tender and putteth forth leaves, is likened unto the Christ's second coming return. When Jesus tells Nathanael, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. This could be what Philip was discussing under the fig tree with the Lord, and the result of that prayer was what Jesus told him in John 1, 47. So I have references to the fig tree. Judges 9, 10 to 11, uh, being the nation of Israel. 1 Kings 4, 25, 2 Kings 18, 31, Proverbs 27, 18, Song of Solomon 2, 13, Isaiah 34, 4, Isaiah 36, 16, Jeremiah 8, 13, Hosea 9, 10, and I have a whole bunch more. Then you have number two, the olive tree. Olive tree, here we go again. The olive tree typifies Israel in covenant relation with God. 
You have the, the olive tree, Deuteronomy 24, 20. Judges 9, 8 to 9. First Kings 6, 23. Uh, Psalms 52, 8. Isaiah 17, 6. Isaiah 24, 13. Jeremiah 11, 16. Hosea 14, 6. And many other passages. Number three, the vine tree. The vine tree is Israel was not supposed to be a corrupt vine. But that's what happened with the vine tree. They ended up becoming a corrupt vine. That's why in the book of John, you can read about Jesus is the true vine. See, it's in relation to Israel. See, in the, oh, we got Mike here, here. Let me get him in there. So um, so we have the uh, the vine tree, okay? So, so we're doing the different trees. I'm trying to show you this for the context of John 1. Now we we and, and we have for the vine tree number six four Ezekiel fifteen two Ezekiel fifteen six John fifteen okay that was where Jesus Christ is the true vine remember that's in relation to Israel people want to apply everything to the church right <laughs> so we have uh, the wild olive tree point four the wild olive tree now what's the wild olive tree this is where our Calvinists get stuck. Romans 11, 17 and Romans 11, 24. When you go to Romans 9 to 11 and you start going through these trees, you're going to find out, wait a minute, this tree has nothing to do with the nation of Israel. The wild olive tree is dealing with the Gentiles. Mm, mm. Oh, that'll mess a Calvinist up, won't it? Well, the bramble, the bramble. The bramble deals uh, in Judges 9, 14 to 15, Luke 6, 44, Isaiah 34, 13. And that's also dealing with Gentiles. So the wild olive tree and the bramble, when you read about these trees, are mainly dealing with Gentiles. I don't find any reference to the nation of Israel with those trees. Okay. So why is that so important? Because remember, we were talking about the fig tree and, and Nathaniel earlier, right? In Matthew 13, 44, concerning the hid treasure. Remember, we have these, these parables, right? According to this parable, Jesus did not just die to save sinners. Now, why am I going to Matthew 13 instead of keeping it in John 1? Well, I'm trying to show you something really quick. And just pay attention to this truth, and then you'll see where I'm going with it. So in Matthew 13, 44, concerning the hid treasure, remember there's a hid treasure. According to this parable, Jesus did not die, just die to save sinners, right? He died to purchase the field so that one day he could redeem and gather Israel from the dispersion and establish the kingdom promised to their fathers. See, there's more than one angle to look at the cross work of Christ. A lot of times we only look at it one way. <laughs> And we, we forget Israel. We forget the benefits that come from the cross work of Christ for the for the benefit of Israel. And we only go to ourselves in the church. God is not a liar. He's going to he's going to keep his promises to the nation of Israel. OK, so. Very important that we're talking about this, because remember, in John one, we're talking about Nathaniel, right? Are we talking about Nathaniel there? And he was an Israelite indeed. Indeed, an Israelite? <laughs> Why do you say indeed the church? <laughs> no, because there is a truth in the context concerning Israel in that whole de descending and ascending upon the Son of Man and heaven being opened. All right, well. Well, we did that. John 14, 12. Dealing with the works after Christ has ascended in the believer. After Christ finished work on the cross and ascension, he can now indwell believers and have greater works through the believers than if he was in a single location at a period of time. Correct? Remember he told Nathaniel, thou shalt see greater things than these. And when you look at John 151 and you got the church in view, Come on, if we if we just look at the church in view, not just Israel, but the church also in view. Well, here we got a truth about something that's greater than what happened under the fig tree. Correct. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1 27. John 6 56. He dwelleth in me and I in him. Galatians 2 20. Christ liveth in me. First John 4 4. Greater is he that is in you. And John 5.20, dealing with the works of Christ that the Father will work through Christ. 
So we saw we have greater works than these, right? So Genesis 28, 12, I want you to pay attention to the wording here. Let's pay attention to some wording. Remember, this is our cross-reference for John 1, 51. And Brother Mike talked about this earlier. And Jacob, right? Jacob, look at Genesis 28, 12. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land, uh, Isaac, the land whereon thou liest to thee, will I give it, and to thy seed. You see that? What is the, what is the whole prophecy here dealing with? Uh, uh, certainly an Israelite should understand this because he's saying, I'm on top of this ladder and I'm looking down and I'm giving you this land. <laughs> See, an Israelite, indeed, you should understand this. I'm going to, I'm going to be faithful to my promises, but you know what, you know when these promises are going to happen? These promises are going to happen after Jesus already came and died on a cross and rose again the third day. And then if you go fast forward to the end of the tribulation, they're going to look upon Jesus whom they have pierced. And, the, and that remnant of Israel is going to believe and the whole house of Israel is going to go into the millennial kingdom. And God's going to say, hey, you remember the prophecy that I told you about? The ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, and I'm looking down upon you, and I'm going to give you this land, and I kept my promise. Amen. <laughs> and for the church, and for the church, hey, the Son of Man's ascending and descending. How? How can I get to God? How can I be right with God? I got to get up on Jacob's ladder. And guess what? I'm going to come back with him to go to the millennial reign, and I say, how did I get there? By Jacob's ladder. See, there's a truth for Jew and Gentile. There's a truth for the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. That's why you don't need to mix these things up and mess up the Bible. Very important. Very important. So let's look at a little bit more here. Got a little bit of time. I told you I want to spend a little bit of time on this. It's on earth, right? The ladder. It's on earth. And its top reaches to heaven. It reaches from earth to heaven. And the angels of God ascend and descend upon it. And in John 1, 51, Jesus said, I am Jacob's ladder. I am standing on earth and can reach to heaven. And you can get from earth to heaven through me. Amen. Jesus didn't say he would cleanse the lepers, walk on water, heal the sick, but he did say that Nathaniel would see a way made from earth to heaven, and that's the great thing you're going to see. So the greater things than these that he was talking about is Jesus making a way to reach heaven from earth. Amen. Amen. We talked about Isaiah 59, but uh, I'll just kind of... Uh, Kind of lump sum some of this up. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Jesus is the ladder over the eternal separation from God because of sin. Luke 16, 25, the good things the rich man received did not lead him to repentance. Romans 2, 4, because the goodness of God led thee to repentance. And he could have had eternal life, 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 18. The rich man now has no possible way to bridge the gap over the great goal fixed, Mark 9, 47 to 48, because he never bridged the gap because of his sin while he was yet alive, John 3, 20 to 21. To trust in what God has revealed to him through Moses and the prophets, Luke 16, 31. And if he will not respond to the light given him through Moses and the prophets, then he will not trust in Christ. Luke 16, 31, though one be risen from the dead. So Genesis 1, 2, even though God created all things good, Genesis 1, 1, Genesis 1, 4, Ecclesiastes 7, 29, man has chosen to sin. See, they have sought out many inventions. Romans 5, 12, Ecclesiastes 7, 29, again. So man starts off without relationship and fellowship to God. And that relationship is without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep of that relationship. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, John 3, 19. But the only thing that will bridge the gap between man and God is the spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters. John 7, 38. 
Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the only way that is possible is for you to believe the scriptures. John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them. You think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. John 16, 8 to 11, right? So more cross references there. So check this out. This is pretty neat as a comparison. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. I got to go. I got to be quick about this. And you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Right? And I could go to verse 2 and verse 3, but we don't have time. Then, then comes Jacob's ladder, Ephesians 2, 4 to 5. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. Look. Amen. From earth, Ephesians 2, 11 to 12. Look at this one. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. And I could read verse 12. But then comes Jacob's ladder, Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye, so, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who had made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And I could keep going. But then Titus 3.3, 3, look at this one. Titus 3.3, 3, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But then comes Jacob's ladder, the next verse. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Look at Romans 5, 6 to 7. We got to be quick about this. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Then comes Jacob's ladder, Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at Luke 23, 41. And we indeed justly, for we received the due rewards of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. Then comes Jacob's ladder, Luke 23, 41. Oops, I'm sorry. Luke 23, 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, today, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Huh? Jacob's ladder, eh, man? Come on, can anybody get hyped up about that? He didn't leave us without a ladder. He didn't leave us down here on earth to die in our own sin, to to. to to build our own ladder like Adam and Eve trying to build, build an apron out of fig leaves. Come on, guys. Jesus made a way. He made a way for all mankind to be forgiven of their sins. To be made a way for all man, all mankind to have eternal life. He made a way. He made a way. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 10:11. Hebrews 10, 11. Then comes Jacob's ladder. Hebrews 10, 12. Romans 3, 20. Then comes Jacob's ladder. Romans 3, 21 to 22. Romans 4, 4. Then comes Jacob's ladder. Romans 4, 5. So the greater thing Nathaniel will see is more than just Jesus seeing him under the fig tree, which pictures the nation of Israel and Nathaniel under that tree. The greater thing Nathaniel will see is getting out of being under the fig tree and taking his sins under the tree of life where Jesus becomes the ladder from heaven, from earth to heaven. The greater thing Nathaniel will see is that even though Jesus saw him under the fig tree, he will see Jesus on the old rugged tree becoming the ladder from earth to heaven. How about that? Jesus is greater than the temple. He's the ladder, Matthew 12, 6. Jesus is greater than Solomon, Luke eleven thirty one. 31. He's the ladder. Jesus is greater than Jonah, Luke eleven thirty two. 32. Jesus is the ladder. Jesus is greater than John the Baptist, John 1, 30. He's the ladder. Jesus is better than the angels, Hebrews 1, 4. He's the ladder. Jesus is the better blessing, Hebrews 7, 7, because he's the ladder. Jesus is better than the law, Hebrews 7, 19. He's the ladder. Jesus is better than, he's the better testament, Hebrews 7, 22. He's the ladder. Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant, Hebrews 8, 6, because he's the ladder. Jesus established better promises, Hebrews 8, 6, because he's the ladder for Jew and Gentile. Jesus is the better sacrifice, Hebrews 9, 23. Jesus is a better Jesus gives a better and enduring substance. Jesus, uh, that's Hebrews 10, 34. Jesus can give a better country. Hebrews 11, 16. Jesus is the better resurrection. Hebrews 11, 35. Jesus provided some better thing for us. Hebrews 11, 40. Jesus' covenant and blood speaks better things than that of Abel. Why? Because Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the King of glory, God manifest in the flesh, the only sinless person that ever lived is the ladder. He is Jacob's ladder. 
And he's not only Jacob's ladder, my friend. Can you call him your ladder? Amen. Uh, how about that? How about that for a, for a kind of a close out? Is he your ladder today? We know he's Jacob's ladder in the Bible, but my friend, he need, Jacob's ladder needs to be your ladder. Amen. He needs to be your ladder. Will you believe and trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again the third day? He's made a way to open heaven for you. He's made a way that you can now ascend to the right hand of God the Father. You can ascend to Christ and have fellowship with Christ today. If you die today, you could have that. But my friend, the key factor, the key factor of what we always bring to the table concerning this truth is, are you willing to believe? Amen. Are you willing to believe on Jesus Christ? He won't make you. He's The ladder's available. The ladder's there. <laughs> It's not broken. It's, it's, it's made out of deity material. It's Jesus himself. You can trust when you get on the ladder. You're going to get where the ladder's destination will lead you. My friend, do you have Jesus today? That is Jacob's ladder. It's Jesus Christ. Will you believe or will you reject the only means there's only one ladder there. There aren't, there aren't different ladders. There isn't a Buddhist ladder there. There isn't a, a Darwinian ladder there. There's only one ladder. It's Jesus Christ. Will you get on the ladder? Please, please, my friend. It's like a man. It's like a man uh, standing on the edge of a cliff with a blindfold on. I'm trying my best to stop him from taking one more step. But you know what? If he will not listen to me, you know, and, and I'm far away, I can't stop. If I'm far away, I can't stop him. I can't grab him and stop him. But if, but if I yell at him and I tell him, hey, don't take another step. Turn around and choose life. And he doesn't listen. He's going to take that step. Oh, you're crazy. How dare you tell me that I'm going off of a cliff? That's that's ridiculous. Everybody that I know went this way. <laughs> Everybody that I know that's blindfolded, that can't see, and, and, and they, they all fell into the ditch. I mean, you know, I didn't hear anything bad about what they did. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do, you know what? You need to get on Jacob's ladder. You need to get on Jesus Christ today. You need to believe on him. We like if it takes me beckoning with you, it takes me lifting up my voice a little bit, I'll do so. But, if, but I don't want to see anybody die in their sin needlessly when you've got a ladder there for you, waiting for you, that Jesus made possible for everyone to get on. Look, it's not only Jews can get on that ladder. It's not only Gentiles that can get on that ladder. It's not only rich people that, that, can, that can go to the, to the ticket usher and give them a ticket. Well, okay, you can get on the ladder because you got your ticket. No, my friend, you can get on the ladder. All you got to do is believe on Jesus Christ. You're on the ladder. Will you do that today if you're lost and undone? And if you're saved today, how do you look at that ladder saying, you know, Jesus supplied me a ladder. And now, 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 now you know, I'm in Christ now. I got on the ladder. I know where I'm going when I die. And then continue, continue to live your life as if you never got on the ladder. What, what kind of life is that? What, what kind of life? Come on, guys. We look back at the cross of Jesus. We look back at the Jacob's ladder. We say, why did I get on this ladder? I'm still living my life as if the ladder never existed. So get on the ladder, my friend. Get on the ladder, get saved. And then after you get saved, look back at that ladder. Say, I'm so thankful God supplied me with this ladder. He's so gracious. He's so merciful. The least I could do was live my is live my life for him each and every day and honor him because of the ladder that he gave to me. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I'm going to end it there. I gave the gospel message right in my answer. So praise the Lord. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, that's my closeout. Ask more questions. We're running low on questions yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, ask more questions. I uh, posted on Facebook all the questions we have left, including the one for tonight. Uh, but you can look at my post and read all the questions that we have left. It's not a lot, guys. So ask more questions if you would. It'd be a blessing. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your prayers for the ministry, prayers for me, 
uh, Brother Mike and Brother Justin to keep this thing going. We thank you. We thank you. We really do thank you for getting on and supporting this ministry. And I'm going to go ahead and let Brother Mike close out. Go ahead, brother. Hey, Amen. Well, that was good when I heard of it. I'm sorry I, had, I got knocked off for a bit there. I was blessed to get back on. The most important question, are you saved? John John chapter 10, barely, first one. Barely, barely, I say unto you, he that entereth, entereth not by the door of the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way. The same as a thief and a robber. Verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life. Jesus Christ is the door. You're not going to find another way. You're not going to find heaven without Jesus Christ. Everybody thinks they have their own ideas. And God is the only way. We want to see you in heaven someday. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God will.